It is an extraordinary day. Much has been said about the diversity of the groups and the diversity of the people who have come together for this rally. It's so disappointing that there have been many attempts to discredit us and to discredit you, many of whom have made extraordinary efforts to get here today. I'm not sure what Macquarie Street were thinking they would see when they look out of their windows and into this crowd, but I'm telling you that what I see is mothers and fathers and women and men and families and country people and city people, all who have put their differences aside to come today to rally to protect our land and our water. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you are just normal people doing an extraordinary job and you deserve to be applauded by the government and not condemned. We have been told that we are playing politics. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you that this issue is bigger than politics. The sustainability of our land and our water is much bigger than politics. The sustainability of our land and water is bigger than the divisiveness of political persuasions and political parties, certainly much bigger than the political cycle. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what this government needs to understand. I've just asked if you could please, the, the placards look absolutely fantastic, but you're just blocking the filming a little bit. So could you just lower them just in front of us here? And everyone else can keep them up, but just for the filming, it would be great if you could just lower them a little bit and give your arms a bit of a rest. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Fiona Simpson, and I'm very proud to be a farmer from the northwest of the state. <laughs> from the wonderful Liverpool Plains region. But today, in my role here as president, I am proud to be representing members, representing farmers, representing people from right across the state. And I know you've come from everywhere. What about the Liverpool Plains? Who's supporting the Liverpool Plains? What about Gloucester? Who's here to support Gloucester? I'm sure that there are people here from the Southern Highlands. What about the Merriwar region? Who has come to support Merriwar? And what about Mudgee? Come on, who cares about Mudgee? What about the Central West? Is there anyone here to support them? And what about the coast? Who's here to support the coast? Ladies and gentlemen, we have people. What about, lastly but not least, who's here from the Sydney Basin? We care about all the land in New South Wales, wherever you are from, here, here and everywhere. There is no doubt that we are all in this together and I congratulate you all coming together today to join your voices and make them heard. What about the Hunter Valley? The Hunter Valley! I love the Hunter Valley! Oh, anywhere else? Thermia! Thermia! Anywhere else? I can't believe I left out the Hunter Valley! Petersham! What about the people in Petersham just down the road? We have a lot of people here. The Northern Rivers! The Northern Rivers! Where else? Anywhere else? Well? The Illawarra! Who's from the Illawarra? What about right up on the north of the border? What about that Maori Mungandai region? Who cares about Maori? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, prior to the last election, we received a number of assurances from the government. We were told that they understood that the process was very poor. We were told that they understood that the process needed to change. We were told that they understood that landholders' rights were being eroded 
and we were told that they understood the importance of identifying and protecting our land and our water. New South Wales farmers had an agreement with the Government and the Minerals Council that things had to change and that mining would no longer trump all other land uses and we were happy to support the Coalition as it gained power in 2011. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the draft policy falls far short on not only what we agreed, but in fact far short on what the community was promised. The, the government promised statewide protection of water, but they proposed to apply the aquifer interference policy to only a fraction of the state. The government promised to assess all interference with aquifers, but yet they're turning a blind eye to the pincushion effect of exploration. And the government promised to make upfront assessments and decisions where CSG and mining should and should not go, yet they leave a decade-long cloud of uncertainty over our families, over our communities, over our businesses and over our industries before putting us through a gateway process. We are told, ladies and gentlemen, of the importance of the so-called jobs and royalty dollars. But what of the importance of our food producing lands and soil and water? We are so privileged, ladies and gentlemen, we can grow 93% of our own food right here at home. But to say that we don't have to plan ahead to ensure that, that we can continue to do that in the future is ridiculous. Every drop of water we lose, every piece of productive soil we dig up, ultimately places at risk not only our ability to feed ourselves, but also to continue to play our part in feeding the expanding global population. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have, and I knew, know you have too, sat through dozens and dozens of meetings and written folders full of submissions. Yet here we are still presented with a policy that fails on so many levels. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why we're here today. We're here today because it's not too late for this government. The government says that it has recognised the need for change. Now in this public consultation period, it is important that they know how we feel. It is important that they know how important this issue is to us. It's important that they know this is a whole of community issue and that you are not just some small, noisy minority. It's important they know this issue is bigger than politics and has the power to bring diverse groups of people like it has today. So what do we want this government to do? The government now in New South Wales, I tell you, it has a golden opportunity to propose a policy that is groundbreaking and world's best. <laughs> this government can be remembered as the government who has put a bad policy aside and done the right thing. Do we want that? This government can be remembered as the government who has the foresight to plan ahead for the future and ensure the sustainability of its resources, its land, its water and its people. Do we want them to do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's not too late. Join me in telling this government now that now is the time for it to act on its commitments and make sure that its policy reflects that. Now. Country and city united we stand. Protect our water, protect our land. Country and city united we stand. Protect our water, protect our land. Once more, country and city united we stand. Protect our water, protect our land. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. 
I, it gives me very great pleasure now to introduce to, do, to you today the next speaker. As you know, this is a huge coalition of over 24 community groups and interested people who have joined us here today in this rally. That is an enormous, enormous effort. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Elaine Armstrong, who is the president of the Country Women's Association of New South Wales. is a farmer from the Riverina and she was elected president of the Country Women's Association of New South Wales in May 2010. The women of the CWA, while believing deeply that their role in the family is vitally important, have been initiators, fighters and lobbyists. They've made localities into communities by providing social activities and educational, recreational and medical facilities. Elaine is a retired teacher, has been a member of the CWA for 20 years. And ladies and gentlemen, if I'm not wrong, and Elaine may say this herself, but I have a feeling that this is the first time that the CWA has taken to the streets of Sydney in its 90 year history. <laughs> What an introduction that was. And yes, we are here to support our country and city protecting our land and water. As State President of the Country Women's Association of New South Wales, I'm standing here together with members uh, in support of this rally, protect our land, protect our water. Our CWA focus is from the community point of view. We're an association of 10,000 women and we're speaking out today with the attitude of wanting to voice our concerns for the land and water that will be affected if we are not vigilant in calling on decision makers to be more aware of our concerns for the protection that is needed for the communities we represent, big and small, city and country. Communities need to have exclusion zones so that contamination of their water and land is not even, even compromised in the slightest. A promise was given that there would be upfront assessments before exploration licences would be granted. This promise has not happened and we're now 12 months down the track. We have members, we have members in communities where there is uncertainty as to their future especially those in prime agricultural and primary production areas. Unbelievable. True. <laughs> where access to essential water is being threatened and where protection of land and water translates into food and fibre for all of us, no matter where we are. These communities are also, they know that this effectively leads to mental health problems associated with depression, in, especially in smaller towns and children, true. Our members have heard anecdotes and experienced personal examples of what has happened from unregulated exploitation of prime land by the granting of mining and coal seam gas exploration permits. Many have personal experience of irreparable damage done to their properties because of non-regulated activities. The strategic regional land use policy promised pre-election in February 2011 promised communication with communities right across the state, insisting that there would be strong legislation to protect property rights and balance the concerns of all communities no matter where they were. This has not happened. <laughs> CWA's decision to put voice to protect our land and water is because our members are concerned for the future of our communities, for city communities as well as those in rural, regional and remote areas. We have over the years written letters and made presentations to ministers and other people who are decision makers, but we are stepping out now uh, to show our concerns. Land is an infinite resource. We need to be vigilant. Water good clean water, especially in a dry con con continent like we have here in Australia, is to be valued and not taken for granted. Without good, without good clean water, our communities will be jeopardised. Likewise will the future for our food and fibre. Yes, we are celebrating 90 years in this association of caring women, and as to my knowledge, yes, this is the first time we have partaken in a rally in the city. In the past, 
In the past, we've achieved much by rolling up our sleeves to get on with the job. This is more than tea and scones, believe me. <laughs> this is about protecting our land and water. And we add our concerned voices of 10,000 women to call for wiser policies to be made to protect our land, our water and our communities. And I, I would echo again, country and city, united we stand. Protect our water, protect our land. City, united we stand, protect our water, protect our land. City, united we stand, protect our water, protect our land. City, united we stand, protect our water, protect our land. Ladies and gentlemen, during the week we were called irrelevant. Do you feel irrelevant? Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you Elaine very, very much for that and we welcome the CWA's interest in participation and commitment <laughs> to making sure that we get a good policy outcome, which is what we are all about here. We are all about getting a good outcome for the people of New South Wales. It gives me a very great pleasure now to introduce to you Mr Martin Rush, who is the Mayor of Musselbrook Shire Council. Martin was born and raised in Young in country New South Wales. He studied economics and law at the University of Newcastle and currently practices as a barrister, principally in safety and industrial law. He's been the Mayor of Musselbrook since 2008 and the Chair of the Hunter Councils since 2010. The Musselbrook local government area has the second highest intensity of coal mining in the state behind its southwestern neighbour Singleton. The Shire is also home to substantial agricultural industries, including of course the viticulture and thoroughbred industries who are also Can I begin by thanking you for allowing me to speak at this rally today and to represent the views and uh, aspirations of my very, very small community in country New South Wales. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I read this morning in the Sydney Morning Herald that 0.1% of this state is subject to coal mining. I guess uh, if you're prepared to accept that the only thing to be taken into account are the pits and the long walls and not the attendant disturbances, and if you're prepared to take a static or point in time assessment, then uh, that might be right. Uh, but for those of us who are interested in science, for those of us who want to proceed in a way that doesn't have us uh, portrayed as lunatics, for those of us who want to proceed in a way that listens to the land use conflict and resolve them, we know that what matters is the cumulative disturbance over time and in my LGA that's 50% of the rateable area. <laughs> and I read in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning that there have only been new, three new mines since 2005. <laughs> well, that, if you're prepared, if you're prepared to only consider or define a mine as the body corporate or the mining operation, that is the trading operation, uh, but not intuitively how we would define it, and that is a hole in the ground, uh, then it might be right. Uh, but I can tell you that the holes in the ground in my shire since 2002 have tripled. And if the mining industry wants to approach this debate and this argument and find a solution, and retain its credibility, it will need to start engaging in this debate in a much more measured and scientific way. Yeah. Can I indicate my appreciation for the thoroughbreeders and vignerons particularly, who have at all times proceeded in this debate on science in a very measured and analytical way. And I appreciate that, and my community does too, I ask that the mining industry follow suit. You know, we were promised in March 2011 certainty and protection of agricultural land. What we got instead 
was a panel which at some future point in time may have aspirations to do that very thing. But government is hard work. It's reading long and boring documents early in the morning and late at night and ultimately resolving controversy by making decisions. This is a government that loves to appoint panels, tribunals, chairs of infrastructure committees to make important decisions. But we were promised a decision which would pr protect us and we elect governments to govern and to make those hard decisions no matter how politically unfavourable they may be. It is time that New South Wales have a, had a government that was prepared to govern. Yeah! Musselbrook, Musselbrook is the only town of its size in Australia to be ringed by past, present and proposed future coal mining. And you can imagine that the conflict between the urban land use and the mining land use is considerable. And the management of that conflict is what protects our community from the impact on human health, on dust, on noise, and of course, on the future economic development of the urban community. And yet, those urban land use conflicts with mining don't trigger the gateway assessment. In other words, this gateway process has made families and men and women and communities second-rate considerations in the planning process. It is time that the urban land use was considered as triggering that gateway process too. You know, we have a golden opportunity to get this right. The mining industry says an awful lot how terribly regulated it is, when in truth it is one of a handful of industries not subject to cumulative zoning assessment. That's important. We know in local government how important that zoning process is. It allows us to manage cumulative impact, allows us to make sure we can deploy appropriate infrastructure, and it makes sure that we can manage land use conflict with others. The mining industry has no such equivalent process to ensure that that work is done. It only has the incremental development application stage. What we need in this state is the orderly planned exploitation of coal in those areas which present which with least land use conflict. That is science. That is truly objective. That is a principled planning system. It's also hard work. I think it's high time that the, we had a government in New South Wales prepared to do that hard work. I want to send a very simple message to the nationals. You have an opportunity to stand tall, to govern, to bring certainty to these diverse industries and in so doing protect sovereign overseas investment in our rural communities. On this May Day, can I encourage the New South Wales Nationals to do what is right, to stand tall, and if that means entering into a dispute with your coalition partners, then that is what you ought to do. Thank you very much, Martin. Let's thank Martin. Let's thank Martin. Very wise words. It is now my great pleasure to welcome to, to the podium a man who needs no introduction for many of you, and that is Mr Drew Hutton, who is President of Lock the Gate. Let me tell you about him. He's the President of Lock the Gate Alliance, which is a national alliance of local community, professional, industry and environmental groups concerned about fossil fuel industries and the imbalance between the rights of landholders and the rights of fossil fuel industries. Drew is an academic, a campaigner and a past political candidate for the Greens in local, state and federal government elections. He's lectured at Queensland University of Technology and the University of Southern Queensland. Please welcome Drew Hutton. Thank you very much. I'm from Queensland and a couple of years ago I went bush to investigate calcium gas. And I said to farmers out there, 
Uh, we can't win this as purely a farmer's battle. And we can't win this as an environmental battle. What we've got to do is bring the two together. Bring farmers and environmentalists, city and country together. Yeah. And this rally here today is the best expression of that I've ever seen. Yeah. We are unstoppable. Now, I want to pay, I want to acknowledge two people before I start. The first is not here today, but he's played a, a magnificent role in getting us to where we are now, and that's 2GB radio broadcaster Alan Jones. He's done a great job. The second, the second person I want to acknowledge is Fiona Simpson. She's done a very courageous thing. You would think the natural place for the Farmers Association was inside the tent with the coalition government. Yeah. And of course you want to be inside the tent because that's where decisions are made. But when you go inside the tent and you get completely overlooked and everything that you're asking for is just simply ignored, then the courageous thing to do is go outside the tent, take your message to your grassroots, take your message to the community, put the pressure back on the government and get what you want that way. And the others had the wisdom and the courage to do just that. <laughs> now, I'm the president of Lock the Gate Alliance, about 140 different community organisations, mostly in Queensland and New South Wales. I'm from Queensland and uh, I've heard a few people in New South Wales call calcium gas the Queensland disease. And I can understand why they say that. When you come down from Queensland, if you go down the Lions Road towards Kyogel, thank you Kyogel, you, um, you see all, you're almost blinded. If you're on a motorbike, you're, you're, your life's in danger because you're almost blinded by these yellow lock the gate signs all along the road. And then you get to the Northern Rivers and every street, every road, whole local authority areas, the whole region has locked the gate. <laughs> then you go over to an area known as uh, Balladra and Gurley and you see this lady here with the pink um, surfboard. Penny uh, <laughs> Blatchford and her crew Every single landowner in that pill, that petroleum export licence area, has locked the gate. Every one of them. <laughs> then you go down to the Liverpool Plains and the Pilliga, that beautiful woodland that should be kept pristine. And Santos is going to find themselves having to write down $2 billion worth of phony investment that they put into that area, because it won't get up. Then you go, then you go down to the Southern Highlands, where the Korean coal company is simply going to find the gate locked on them. Come round to the Sydney Basin, the same thing there. Then, you go, then go up to the North Coast, where they, have, they haven't even got coal seam gas yet, because they're not going to come, because they're too well organised. Then you go, then you go to the Hunter. And you look at those courageous people of Gloucester fighting for their lives. And the hunter, when you're Ian and Robin Moore locked the gate on you, Cole, and you told them to clear off, and they did. And then they are down here. And you know, in the hunter, AGL, are so desperate to get onto private property that they can't get onto private property that they decided to put an application in to go onto the defence land at Singleton. And the army locked the game on them. <laughs> now, now look, we don't want to declare war on the coalition government of New South Wales. We're keen, we're keen to work with this government. We'll be pragmatic. We know that if they show good faith towards what we're talking about, that we will show good faith to them 
and engage in meaningful discussions and work with them towards a, a good settlement of, uh, of our demands. Now, the, they do have to recognise one thing though, that as a government, they have to protect. Protect is the key word. They have to protect our farmland. They have to protect our underground water. They have to protect the health and immunity of people, especially in rural New South Wales. And they have to protect our beautiful wild places and our environmental assets. Yeah. That's the role of government. The coal seam gas industry said the other day, we can't have government interference in that industry because that would be protectionism. Well, I got news for them. It's the role of government to protect. And this government needs to take up that challenge and do that. And if they do, they'll find we'll work with them. But if they don't, if they are silly enough to ignore a rally like this, if they are silly enough to ignore the clear, scientifically based, logical arguments that we put forward, all of the groups that are represented here today have put forward over the previous 18 months, then we will continue to lock the gate. Philip is an independent engineering consultant who has spent four decades in geotechnical and groundwater engineering. Dr Powell's authored a scientific report questioning whether falling water levels in the Thirlmere Lakes National Park near Sydney are due to coal mining. He is a leading voice in this debate and holds real concerns about the impact that mining and coal seam gas might have on our groundwater. A concern, ladies and gentlemen, I know that, are echo, that is echoed by many. Please welcome Dr Philip Pearls. <laughs> Somewhere in New South Wales, we can grow great quantities of just about anything. But the sustainable production of the farms of New South Wales doesn't depend on the quality of our soil. It doesn't depend on it being hot enough or cold enough. It doesn't depend on it being steep enough or flat enough. It depends on the availability of water. Our richest soils in the Liverpool Plains or on the slopes of Mount Canopolis are worthless without water. Rainfall, our primary source of water, is a variable beast. From the crushing droughts of the Second World War and the Federation period through the first part of this century, to times of great plenty in the First World War, in the 1950s, in the mid-1970s, and in those times of plenties, our rivers run, our dams fill, our wetlands are wet. But more importantly, our groundwater systems are replenished. Great quantities of, of rainfall and seep into the ground and replenish the great artesian basin from the recharge system along the east coast. And also into the fractured rocks and porous rocks of the Sydney Gunnada Basin that extends from Southern Forest to the Narrabri and across west of the divide, in the deep leads and the old fractured rock of the Lockton Fold Belt, Fold Belt. Apart from feeding boars that sustain homes, feed chooks, irrigate orchards and vegetables, the groundwater sustains the base flow of our creeks and rivers, our wetland systems. Diminish those groundwater systems and you create a tendril effect of destruction that extends from an individual vegetable farmer in near Picton to a complete river system like the Yarralong Valley or Gloucester. Now mining has been a part of this country from the ochre pits of the Aboriginals to convicts scrabbling around the mouth of the Hunter Valley to the gold shafts of Hill End and to the wealth of Cadia. There are some here who are against all mining. I'm sorry, I'm not with you. I do believe we're better off with steel, glass, copper, bitumen, paint and preserved food rather than with stone implements and smoky fires. But until a few decades ago, mining tended to be confined to relatively small areas, relatively small. 
There were substantial adverse effects on land, water systems, and important environments. Around some of those mines, such as the massive landslides in the Baragrang Valley and Katoomba, the current rock falls in the Balbone area of the, the Garden of Stone, there's cracking of the Cataract River, draining of swamps in the Nunes Plateau. But most of these impacts were relatively small areas. Now we're dealing with a completely new animal, coal seam gas extraction. This, together with coal seam mining, has the potential to adversely affect groundwater systems over large parts of the state. We are no longer talking about relatively small areas. We are talking about huge areas. The current New South Wales Government of Exploration licences for coal seam gas lists an area of 189,000 square metres, 19 million hectares. To this we must add 24,000 hectares of producing coal seam gas and all the coal mining areas. Together this comprises much of our populated area, our forested wilderness, our wetlands and our rivers. This huge expansion of mining in areas will impact groundwater regime and it has only occurred in an uncontrolled manner over a very short time. Now, in order to extract coal seam gas, you have to completely depressurize the groundwater system and remove the groundwater from that coal seam. It's all going to go or the coal or the gas will not flow. This is the same as a coal mine. In effect, you've got a complete groundwater void down there. It is a matter of physics and not of opinion that this depressurization will affect the whole groundwater system. Because like the metaphorical apple that fell on Sir Isaac Newton's head, groundwater flows under gravity downhill. How long will it take for these changes to be substantial? We don't know. How extensive will they be? We don't know. One thing we do know is encapsulated by Dr. Richard Evans, principal hydrogeologist of St. Clair Merchant. He said, there is no free lunch here. Every litre of water you pump out of the ground reduces river flow by the same amount. The water is extracted from the coal seams over many months. It's saline. It's classified as a pollutant. Typically this water contains half a teaspoon of salt in every litre. That means that in a small coal seam gas field such as at Gloucester with 100 wells, it will produce about 5,000 tonnes of salt every year. Should we as a society allow this process to run helter-skelter? A process whose consequences on our environment are not properly understood by scientists and engineers? Should we wait possibly, like with DDT, Agent Orange, asbestos, thylidomide, until something irreparable occurs. No! I, I think not. I think our government should take a deep breath and allow proper impacts of coal seam gas extraction. Before we leave a legacy for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to say to us, they did what? farmers after she received a draft access agreement from this company offering her, wait for it, five dollars a whole compensation. That's right, five dollars a whole. I spent five dollars on a coffee at the airport only yesterday. Apparently that's how much exploring her land and her water and her business is worth. that people like Mary and Des have ensured that the community is now better informed about their rights and obligations. But here they are, an everyday mum and dad with two kids at school, working their farm whilst trying to protect their land and water on behalf of their community. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> As 
Drew pointed out, we also had Ian and Robin Moore down here at the front. What <laughs> Ian and Robin have been through is nothing short of disgraceful. You might have heard a little bit about their story. They farm in Jerry's Plains, a little town in the Upper Hunter. <laughs> I knew I'd get a rise out of you. <laughs> Ian, Ian was approached by a company called New Coal who wanted to drill on his farm. We've all heard about New Coal, haven't we? <laughs> Ian and Robin are reasonable people. They asked to negotiate. They wanted upfront independent water testing so that they had a baseline to check any impacts. They wanted basic land access provisions such as when and where machinery could go because Ian is legally blind. And you know what New Coal did? They took him to court. They took him to court because he wanted to protect his land and water. Not to say no to mining, but to say, please be sensible. Be sensible about where you mine. I'm pleased to say that we were able to intervene and able to get Ian a win. Not it's a great thing, not through the courts, because the law is set up, the way the law acts in New South Wales is to allow miners access, no matter what, but through public pressure. There are dozens of families in the Jerry's Plains region still fighting new coal. I won't even go into the dubious circumstances surrounding New Coal's exploration licence, because that's another story for another day. But thank you, Ian and Robin. We also have two families in the crowd who are being impacted right now by exploration, by pilot production on a farm right near them, and that is the Sheedies, Judy and Paul Sheedy and Penny and Damien Hare, and their beautiful children as well. They are farmers who are responsibly trying to protect the land and water in their own communities. They are doing a difficult job that lots of people actually think that the government should be doing instead. Yeah. At the moment on their farms, they farm the corn that goes in your cornflakes and they, the wheat that goes in your bread. But everybody up there in that Mullally area is having a very, very hard time of it. Thank you, Penny and Damien and Ju Judy and Paul. <laughs> Lastly, what I want to do is I want to find out, looking up here, I can see an awful lot of people, I think, who don't regularly rally, Not who might be in their 70s and even their 80s. <laughs> what about a cheer for the people who are here in their 70s and their 80s? <laughs> Jim, Bill and Bruce, all who are here in their 80s. Fancy that. Fancy coming down to Sydney and rallying when you're 80. That's not right there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is what this issue is about. It's about the people. It's about the community. And it makes perfect sense, therefore, that I now introduce to the stage the Honourable Andrew Stoner, the Deputy Premier of New South Wales and a leader of the New South Wales Nationals. Take it down! Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please be aware, please be aware that, that Mr Stoner has given up his time. He's the only politician to come up here and stand. So please listen to what he has to say. Thank you much, Fiona, for the opportunity uh, to address you today on behalf of the government. Look, I'm not here today to make any grand announcement about where the policy and the, and the laws governing uh, mining and coal seam gas extraction uh, will go. And I'm not going to do that because we're still in the consultation process. We, and I can assure you all, I can assure you all that the government is listening, the government is listening to each and every one of you. I'm well aware, I'm well aware, I come from country New South Wales myself, I'm well aware of the depth of community feeling about this issue. Even here, even here in the city, when you, when you turn on 2GB in the morning and you hear Alan Jones reflecting a lot of those community concerns, 
about where this is all heading. But I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to start uh, with a a quick uh, update of the background that is behind us all being here today. When we came to office, when we came to office in March last year, we inherited, we inherited a system, we inherited a system with absolutely no protections for our prime agricultural land. We had a government a Labor government that over its 16 years in office issued 44, 44 exploration and production coal seam gas licences. And I want you to know that in contrast the Liberal and Nationals government in New South Wales has issued none, zero coal seam gas exploration licences in the 13 months we've been in power. If you'd like to listen, mate, if you'd like to listen, what we have done, what we have done is we've banned evaporation ponds, we've banned BTEX chemicals, we've extended the moratorium on fracking and we've developed a draft policy to deliver on our election commitment to protect our prime agricultural land and water. And it is, it is a draft, a draft policy and that's why it's a draft policy which we know can be improved. It will be, if you'll, if you'll just shut your mouth for a, for a minute, mate, it will be, don't you worry. I just told you it will be. And that's why we know that the draft policy can be improved and it's why we've provided a further opportunity for the community to make submissions into the final product. We have to get the balance right. We have to get the balance right. We have to protect our farmland and our food bowl while enabling regional communities to take advantage of new economic opportunities. We've been working hard. We've been working hard as a government, given a system which had zero protections but plenty of exploration licences and dodgy deals done, don't worry about that. We've been working hard to get the balance right, consulting with all the stakeholders, including New South Wales farmers, representatives of the equine and viticulture industries, along with environmentalists. Along with environmentalists to get the balance right. That consultation, that consultation, mate, I come from the Northern Rivers and I told you it's going to be in the policy and prime ag land is going to be protected. So, so that consultation process has been ongoing for 13 months now and it's not yet over. On behalf of the government, I'm here to say that we are listening and we welcome your feedback on our draft policy as we look to refine it. But the message, but the message I want to leave you all with is this. If any, if any proposed mining or gas extraction activity is likely to harm our prime agricultural land or other, or other important rural industry clusters or the water resources associated with those areas, it will not go ahead under this government. We have heard it from Andrew himself. We have heard it from the government himself. That is a commitment. That is the commitment. They will not harm agricultural land. They will not harm the water. Please thank Andrew Stoner for coming and talking to you here today. I know you don't always like what he has to say, but please thank him for coming. The other thing is I can see a number of ministers standing up there as well as I think Minister Byrne has out. Let's turn around and tell the government, country and city, united we stand. Protect our water, protect our land. Country and city, united we stand. Protect our water, protect our land. Country and city, united we stand. Protect our water, protect Ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons that we chose
chose to hold this rally right now during this public consultation period is because this is a personal submission from you, from us, to the government. However, we still have much more work to do. We've heard a great deal about the failings of the policy, what this means for local communities, for businesses, for the environment, and most importantly, for our food and water now and into the future. It's easy to think that these problems are insurmountable and that there are interests at stake that are more important than ours. But there are real solutions. There are real glimmers of hope. At the moment, at least we are in a process where the government is trying to deliver a solution. We are not like Queensland. We are not like America. We have the opportunity now to do it right. So let's make sure that they can actually do it right. I have my own solution for the vision for the solutions and you will have yours. And I'd urge you to think of one each time that you think you have a problem. If you're concerned that the groundwater might be damaged by exploration, then we need to propose laws that require proof that a process is safe before it happens. Yeah. If you're worried about explorers that can enter your land against your wishes, seek changes that give you the power to deny them access. Yeah. It's up to you, ladies and gentlemen. It's in your hands. But don't keep your solutions to yourself. Contact the decision makers and tell them what you want. Our jobs don't start and end at the ballot box. Every time we give somebody a seat in the house, that house behind us there, they either work for us for the next four years or they lose that privilege. Yeah. Your local member, and there's a number of them here today dotted throughout the crowd, needs your feedback. We need to ensure that as you go away today, you give it to them in spades. Tell them what you want. How do they know otherwise? Make a submission. This is a tedious job, but we all have to do it, and we must do it if we want to try and get this right. I know you're nearly submissioned out, but we still have to do it. Our website at New South Wales Farmers has a tool which will help you build your response to the draft policies. And we've only got two days more to put in a submission, so you need to do that. If everybody here at this rally visits our site and lodges a submission, I guarantee you the policies must change. <laughs> By coming here today, you've sent a message that you aren't happy, but now it's critical that you go home and tell them what it is you want in government through a submission. Forward your submission and copy it to your local member so that they know that you're onto this issue and that they know what you want. Most importantly, don't get disheartened. This issue is too important. We have so many people here who have downed their tools today and come to tell the government what they thought, what they think. We won't have an answer to this tomorrow. We may not even have an answer in two months' time. But what's important is that we keep talking. We keep talking to each other, but more importantly, we keep talking to the government. See today not as the last hurrah, but as the formation of a network of absolutely thousands of people who all have the same outcomes in mind. From now on, until we reach our objectives, we each have a responsibility to expand that network, to share information and to campaign locally and publicly. The government needs to know that the heat is not falling, but it's rising. And we all have a role to play in that. Thank you for today. Thank you for coming and putting in your submission personally to the people behind you. And as, I, as we all disperse, we need to tell the government one more time what we are here to do. 
city and country, united we stand. Protect our water, protect our land. City and country, united we stand. Protect our water, protect